What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt back with Mike K for the latest episode of the No Huddle Show. Usually Mike is the sick one, but today I am the one that is <laughs> under the weather. But we figured out how to do this remotely, so we're able to stay away from each other, which is probably good for us. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you got to fill the quota. You know, it's got to be yeah, one of us that's sick. sick at all times. Yeah, that's true. It's part of our deal. <laughs> but yeah, so we both got back from Indianapolis a few days ago. Learned a lot out there. Howie Roseman and Doug Peterson spoke. A lot of the prospects worked out. We weren't able to watch the workouts because that's the NFL policy. But um, when you left Indianapolis, like, what was your feeling about what the Eagles do in the draft specifically? I think their their plan is pretty like open ended. It didn't it didn't sent really sound like I mean well well they're always going to be guarded. It did kind of seem like they're going to be a little bit more involved in free agency for sure, but. It also kind of sounds like they're going to stick to their philosophies, which to me is a conflict of interest with both of those, you know, outlooks like their policy has been to have a walking away price with certain positions. Yeah. And now they're saying that they want to be active and go after talented, like top talent players. So I'm, I'm really interested to see, you know, which side of the coin wins out because realistically let's talk about the quarterback market just as an example Byron Jones is gonna make 17 million dollars at the least his yeah. market is pretty large was what I gathered from talking to people in Indy uh James Bradbury not getting franchise is huge one because it kind of helps the Eagles and that there's another guy to negotiate with but also on top of that it takes away maybe the Giants and the Redskins from the negotiating, you know, outlook with Jones because Bradbury's got that background with Gettleman and with Rivera. So in Washington, so it's very interesting to see what happens because if they get into a bidding war and they overpay, which they're going to have to overpay anyway, uh, it'll be interesting. Agency in general, you kind of have to overpay, to right? Get yeah. But when you over overpay and then you. Ne- have to neglect a couple of different positions because of it. It's just interesting to see how that works. And we'll kind of get into this later, but there's clear strengths to this class and there's very clear weaknesses. There's also clear drop-offs and talent uh, at some of the strengths of the draft. So, I I, I mean, it's going to be weird. Are they going to handle free agency, um, you know, as if they're attacking the needs that they feel are opposite the strengths of the draft, or are they going to just fill holes with the best players possible and just go into the draft with an open mind? That's what I'm I'm intrigued by coming out of the combine. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting way to put it. Um, I think Howie kind of indicated that they're going to approach free agency like they did in 2016. What you and I have talked about was pr- maybe arguably their best, uh, Howie's best offseason. I know 2017, he struck on a lot of guys, but I, I think they're going to target guys in the prime of their careers. Byron Jones fits that, um, although, like you said, the price is quite high. Um, one of the most interesting things I think Eagles wise to come out of the combine, though, relates to the left tackle position, which is going in a direction I don't think any of us saw happening necessarily, though we should have considered it because of who's involved, and that's the bodyguard, Jason Peters who is as revered in, in that building as just about anybody that has come through the Eagles in the last decade. And it, like, so Doug Peterson openly said that he wants Jason back, how he indicated they would love to have him back. And then you're hearing rumblings that the Eagles might not be sold on Andre Dillard. I, I think today or yesterday, uh, Albert Breer from Monday, Monday, Monday morning quarterback uh, said that the Eagles have not made a decision yet. And, and they're not, and they're kind of split in the organization about how they feel about Andre Dillard right now. Like that, it's pretty much if that draft pick just has already failed, and that's a really bad look. I, maybe it's too early to say that, but if they're seriously considered bringing back a 38 year old Jason Peters, it's not to be on the bench, and it's not to be playing anything other than left tackle. Yeah, I agree with that. And frankly, I'm leaning towards them bringing him back because they kind of, you know. There's way originally I thought it was they were just trying to be charming about him <laughs> out the gate and I but the more I think about it and the more I talk to people in the around the league and and other writers just from a perspective standpoint I just don't know if Jeffrey Lurie's ready to quit Jason Peters. Yeah. I also think 
that Andre Dillard had a very up and down rookie season, both uh, on the field and in the locker room. I think he really, you know, some of his comments uh, during cleanout day were pretty eye opening about the fans being tough and, and, you know, him kind of, it seemed like he took a lot of the change in his life very personally. Uh, you know, coming from Washington State, you know, you covered the pack. Not a lot going on there uh, in that area. No. To, and he's, from, he's from that area, too. Like, he grew up over there. So. Right. To coming to the other side of the country, far away from family, um, you know, playing left tackle, being the heir apparent to maybe the best left tackle of his generation. Like, it, there's a lot going on there. And I do wonder if you bring back Peters, how that affects Dillard mentally, Um, you know, to have a first round pick sit for two years or be this like the insurance policy to me is very interesting, especially with Big V set to hit free agency and he's going to get some decent money from what I understand. So like, uh, I think Peter King mentioned that in his uh, article, actually, that he might be the after the top guys like Jack Conklin, Big V's like the next tier. Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't yeah. see that. Um, yeah. But yeah, from what I understand, talking to people, like he's going to get starter money. And I, I just, it, it's just a very odd situation. There's no real precedent for a 38 year old. Well, I guess Andrew Whitworth is the yeah. upper guy that's kind of draft a replacement. So that's the big difference. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, I wonder how much vetting the Eagles did with Andre Dillard because they probably thought that he wasn't going to be around. Um, Stoutland had talked to him like the week before the draft, and that was like the last, the, like, they, I don't think they had talked to him that much, but like it happened like right before the draft kind of thing. And that doesn't seem as extensive as they normally would be for their first round targets. I yeah. just, I think, you know, the situation there is they saw him falling. They had needed to draft an heir apparent to Jason Peters for like three years. And their eyes probably got big. And, you know, Dillard physically is very, very capable of playing the position. He's very talented. But I do think the mental aspect of the game is something to monitor with him. There were several times during... Well, I'm not somebody who reads super into quotes as a journalist. But, I mean, when we talked about the right tackle thing, you know, he was very open and honest about how that was a very difficult transition. Uh, you know, he spoke at the end of the season and wasn't very glowing of his rookie season or, you know, his necessarily his experience. I I, I do think there is something to read into there. I do think I I see a lot of Eagles fans, uh, saying, you know, it's hogwash that the Eagles might not have confidence in him or they think Jason Peters is a better solution or whatever. I think there's a lot of reality to that. I do think Jason Peters played well last year. I thought I think he definitely played better than perception. Was he a Pro Bowl talented player? No, but I still would put him probably in the top twelve of the league at left tackle, and that's certainly better than what Andre Dillard has shown so far. Um, I, I'm in favor of them ripping the Band-Aid off and putting Dillard out there, but I could also see internally why they would have interest in bringing Jason Peters back. So just another factor that I think is worth just noting, like the Dillard was an older rookie, so he's turning 25 in October. Yep. So if he so if he sits another year, he wouldn't technically be a starter until his age 26 season. And, and you know, that's rough. I mean, yeah. you know, he's kind of in a situation like Carson Wentz, where Carson Wentz was an older rookie, and now he's, what, 28, or about to be 28, and he's been to the playoffs once, has only played a quarter of playoff football. So people constantly bring that up at the age. Um, I don't think that's necessarily fair. Uh, You know, Andre Dillard also started playing football, I believe, a little bit later into high school. So maybe that helps him. But, like, again, you know, this is a first-round pick. You need to either take a dump or get off the pot. You know what I mean? Like, this is like... um, or you need to, you know, I mean, like, so I think I saw it floated out there from Tim McManus of ESPN, or at least somebody was quoting him from a radio appearance. I didn't see where the radio appearance is from, but uh, I guess the gist of it was maybe they could move 
Alshon Jeffrey with the appeal of Andre Dillard. Like he's the sweetener, so you take Jeffrey's contract or whatever. Right, so that way you don't have to give up a draft asset. I mean, here's my thing, though. If a team is willing to trade away a guy they traded up for in the first round after a year... Not a, not a lot of value there, yeah. Yeah, why would another team... I mean, remember, he fell to 22. It's not like... You know what I mean? Like, it's not like he was a top 12 pick where a lot of teams didn't get their opportunities to get their hands on him. Like, I mean, to me, if, like, I'm the Miami Dolphins, maybe I consider it just because I've got a boatload of cap space and whatever. But, or maybe the, the Bucks like him. I, I, I just, I'm very confused by the logic of that. Like, it, it, in an ideal world, that makes sense, you know. Excuse me. Um... And we'll talk about another guy that would make sense to be connected with with another appealing player a little later on um, for my old stomping grounds. But, like, Mm -hmm. to me, I I don't know what message it sends, but maybe if you don't feel good about the player after a year, maybe it is kind of smart to to cut bait. But that said, uh, Andre Dillard... And J.J. Single whiteside were among your first three picks last year. You've yeah. already cut Clayton Thorson, who was your fifth of five oh, picks. Yeah, uh, Sharif Miller has n- not played a snap on defense. Sure, you have a f- guy who looks like he could become a phenom in Miles Sanders, but dear Lord, like, if you only have Miles Sanders and T.J. Edwards, an undrafted free agent to show for this class, like... I understand you have limited resources, but to miss on four or five players would be insane this early. And, and that's why it's like the the reticence about how his ability to, you know, use these 10 draft picks the best way is fair. Well, and I think that's what's interesting, right, is, is there's a crowd that says, keep all the picks. They need to get younger. Well... With that said, though, I, I think you have to consider, like, their ability to develop, to, to develop players. Like, I, I, yeah. I mean, you also have to consider, like, everybody ta- – I was thinking about this this morning. Everyone talks about the talent of a player. Um, Isaiah Simmons, for, for instance, right? Isaiah Simmons is a guy you can move around and, and use in different ways. He's a unicorn. The problem is unicorns don't eat regular carrots. They eat magical. Mm-hmm. They they eat magical carrots, and so those it, it, it's all about how you prepare them and how you you know feed a guy. You know, in this case, Isaiah Simmons would be you know feeding him with smart ideas and good coaching. And if a team's not up to snuff with a really good player. They can ruin a player. I mean, we, we've seen it happen before. I mean, there are guys that are very special in this league who come in as prospects, maybe have a good rookie year, and then fade into the black. Look at Hassan Riddick. Look at look at a guy like Deion Buchanan uh, when coaching coaches change. So, like, I, I think I think there's some logic to say, hey, first off, let's look at how the Eagles have been able to develop players. Second off, let's look at how they've been able to draft and identify talent. And then on top of that. Uh, Howie Roseman's comments about retooling as opposed to rebuilding, yeah, they want to get younger, but they still want to win. So I, I think that's something yeah. to consider when, when you consider trades and, and um, trading up the board as well. Uh, identifying talent and developing talent are huge equations in this entire process as well. Yeah, I agree. All right, so you, you mentioned your old stomping grounds. Let's take a trip to Jacksonville. Couple Duval. Duval. <laughs> couple of topics to, uh, that have some Eagles questions related to it. Um, we'll start with the less obvious one. Let's talk about Nick Foles real quick. Sure. Um, obviously, anytime his name is mentioned, the Eagles are probably going to be mentioned shortly after that. It sounds like the Jaguars are trying to trade him, which, as I said on Twitter, I think they would incur like an $18 million dead cap penalty if they traded him, which seems like an Ill- ill-advised move. But anyway, so he's on the block. Um, the question of whether the Eagles should get him to be a backup is out there. I think it's pretty obviously a no, but what, what do you think? Yeah, I would say it's a no. Um, I just don't think Carson needs that heat. And I know that says maybe something about the perception of his mental stability, but like 
I don't know if Nick Foles would want to come back here either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, like, I feel like the narrative on both of them together is exhausting for probably both of them. Like, it's unnecessary. And I, I just, like, I don't, from a from a team building standpoint, I don't know what type of stability. It's been two years removed, two from, well, I guess one year removed from that second playoff run. There are guy, a lot of guys on this roster who haven't played with him. Um, I just like, I, I don't think it, it's a logical move. I don't think the Eagles would do that. I know how much they value the quarterback position, but like they would have to like rework his contract to the point where they'd have to rip it up. And I, I, yeah. I just, I don't, I don't see the value in that. I figured we should get that out of the way. <laughs> um, all right. And then the big one is that, uh, in timing that seemed to be on purpose, Yannick Ngakwe, did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. First try. Uh, he, tough. he tweeted basically that he doesn't want to return to the Jaguars, that he enjoyed his time there, love the fans, blah, blah, blah. And then within literally like a minute or two, Adam Schefter tweeted that the Jaguars are franchise tagging Yannick. So uh, that means that in order for him to leave, he's going to have to be traded. Uh, I don't know if the Jaguars are going to try and pull like a Jalen Ramsey type of thing where they force him to play for them and he refuses to or what, but... I would think he has pretty good value, even though everybody knows they're going to trade him. He's 24. He's extremely productive of a pass rusher. He fits the timeline of what the Eagles want. I'm not sure defensive end is like their number one need. And I think you and I think it's a bigger need than maybe the Eagles as an organization do. But I think they at least should explore this possibility, right? Yeah, for sure. And, okay, so let's let's break down Jan. Um, when they drafted Yannick in the third round, uh, in I, I believe it was – 2016, yeah, it was my second year on the beat. I turned to Todd Wash, their defensive coordinator, and I said, Trent Cole, right? And he kind of smirked and smiled. To me, he, and I've talked to Jan about this several times, he is basically a younger Trent Cole. Like before Trent Cole got a little bit thicker, a little bit bigger, um, really good speed rusher, not terrific against the run. Trent Cole got better against, really good against the run later in his career would fit the wide nine. They run a lot of wide nine principles in Jacksonville. Um, you know, their defense isn't completely different from Jim Schwartz's uh, scheme. Um, look, I, he would be a massive talent upgrade. I think he deserves the 20 million that he's asking for. I think he could be a Frank Clark, like game changer for a good playoff team. Um, the year they went to the AFC Championship game, he was not only instrumental, he was incredible. He was the best player on the field, even probably better than Ramsey. Um, I mean, so so looking at his numbers, he's had eight sacks in all four years he's been in the league. Correct. Check he, out his forced fumbles. Check out his forced fumbles. So he, he had zero in 2018, but he had six in 2017, four in 2016, and four in 2019. Um, he has a touchdown. He has a couple picks. He has some pass deflections, and he's pretty productive as a tackler for a defensive end. So. If I were him, I would look for a 3-4 defense because uh, I think he'd be an elite outside linebacker. I've said for years that I thought Jacksonville had the personnel to really dominate as a 3-4. They stuck with their 4-3. Um, here's the issue with him, okay? You're going to have to trade a premium asset, and then you're going to have to pay him. It would be one thing if he was a free agent. Um Look, he's only 24, so if you're trading for him, he's, you're basically using your first-round pick on an Andre Dillard guy. Uh, you know, aged guy, but with four years of experience. So yeah. that's interesting. He's from the Northeast. Uh, he went to Maryland. Uh, he did ruffle some feathers in the locker room. Uh, he's an extremely competitive person, very emotionally driven. Um, He's got a background with Malik Jackson, so he That's fits true. into the cohabitation matrix. Uh, he, you know, obviously, he's a guy that I, and I'm not trying to dance around this, he is a guy that brings a lot of passion, and he is very team-oriented. He's probably one of the hardest-working players I've ever covered. That said, he is extremely intense, and I could see that being somewhat of an issue in this locker room not that everybody's like chilled and laid back but and that everybody gets along we know that not to be true based on several reports in our own reporting um but he is a guy who 
sometimes will let his emotions get the best of him. And so I think that could turn the Eagles off a little bit. Also, the fact that they've spent a ton of money on Brandon Graham. Fletcher Cox makes roughly $20 million a year. They spent a first-round pick on, excuse me, Derek Barnett. They, I know for a fact that they like Josh Sweat a lot. So, like, are you going to invest maybe a second-round pick and a future third-round pick and $20 million a year in Yannick Ngakwe? Like, that's really what the question is. I think he'd be a great fit for the defense schematically. I think he has the personality, if he can keep his emotions in check, that would work here. I think the fan base would love him. Um, at times, I think he'd be the best guy on the field with Fletcher Cox getting older and really expensive. You don't know how much longer he's going to be here. Um, So he could take over that as that elite player on the defensive line. He would certainly help the, the, the pass coverage. There's a lot to like about him. I just don't know if Howie Roseman's going to say, yeah, let's give up on Derek Barnett because you're not picking up the fifth year option. If you trade for him. Um, I was was, going to say what it, I don't think the Eagles would do this, but what do you think about like Derek Barnett and a pick for uh, Yannick? I mean, that would be interesting. I think you would need to do something of that ilk because I don't see. First off, I think the leverage of a Jaguars trade is still there. I don't think they're going to get what they want for him. Yeah. I think this situation has played out much differently than than the Ramsey trade in that they really dug their cleats in. It was in the middle of the year. The Rams, in my opinion, made a very foolish trade uh, for that value. Um, yeah, I've talked to people in the league that think that the Rams basically goaded themselves. Uh, it, it, I, I mean, it was ill-advised, in my opinion. They were trying to go for it all when they didn't have it all, you know what I mean? And I I think that they will regret that trade over the next few years. Jan, I think you could probably get him for a two. Um, You know, it, it, maybe it's a two and Derek Barnett to sweeten the pot, because I do think Derek Barnett would probably benefit from a change of scenery as well. There are a lot of guys on this team, especially guys that they've invested draft picks in where, Either they've lived up to, they haven't lived up to standards, or they've only just met standards. And I think, like at some point, you need to say, you know, we need to do a better job of evaluating and not necessarily cut our losses because I do think Derek Barnett's a very good player and will still continue to develop. But maybe it's that you need to change the oil, you know? Yeah, that, I think that makes sense. Uh, um, while we're on Jacksonville, though, I proposed a trade yesterday. I don't know if you got. I, I did see that. Yeah. Um, so AJ Boye corner um, has two years left on his deal. He's got 27 unguaranteed million dollars left on his contract. As opposed to trading for somebody like Darius Slay, Boye is a year younger. Um, he has no guaranteed money. So you can, and he's coming off kind of a down year. You can kind of negotiate. You have the leverage there to where if you traded a fourth round pick and let's say Rasul Douglas for him, you'd have the ability to kind of renegotiate his deal to lower his cap number, probably to 10 million, uh, lower his salary. You extend him a couple of years. The Eagles seemingly like, uh, from what I remember, liked him in 2017 when he signed. Yeah, they, yeah, they, were, they, were, they were one of the teams pursuing him. I, I just don't think they were willing to go as high as the Jaguars did. Right. And I think Boye can be a very, very good number two. Uh, we brought up the 2017 AFC championship game run. Uh, look, Boye at times was significantly better, playing better than anybody else in that secondary, even Jalen Ramsey. Like, no one targeted Jalen Ramsey. They targeted A.J. Boye a ton. and he, Boye had, came, he, had six, he had six picks that year. Yeah, I mean, Boye is a talented player. Uh, fits perfectly into a cover three. Uh, tackles well. Very aggressive. Great team guy. He's a guy, if you're looking at the Jaguars and you're like, well, Yannick Ngakwe is probably a pipe dream. AJ Boya could be interesting because I could see the, the Jaguars are kind of in a cap situation where they only have like $20 million. And while people say, oh, well, it's $20 million, you can do a lot with that. You know, the Eagles have $45 million and they're like in the middle of the pack, you know, as far as uh, negotiating power with contracts because you've got teams that have over 100000 in the cap space. So 
you know, I could see the Jaguars wanting to get rid of him for a, a draft asset and opening up some cap space. He'd be a guy that I would consider um, if you couldn't match, you know, the market for Byron Jones or if you didn't want to trade for Darius Slay, who wants to be paid amongst the highest in the league. I don't think Boye would cost nearly as much. Yeah, I, I think that I think that would be really – that's a Howie-type move too. Right. Yeah, well, because here's the thing. He has no guaranteed money, and he's got two years left on his deal. It's not like Slay, who's got one year, and, and so that gives him leverage. You're trading for a guy. Okay, cool. You don't want to, you don't want an extension and more guaranteed money. Fine, we'll take you as is. You can be on this two year deal. We can cut you next year if you're terrible and your market's gonna be awful. So here, let's lower your cap number. Let's lower your annual salary. We'll give you twenty million dollars in guaranteed money. You've got your your salary is gonna be two, you know, twenty ten million a year over three years and realistically it's a two-year deal you're just guaranteeing those two years you got the third year as a team option or fourth year as a team option whatever i i I think it makes a lot of sense yeah i I agree all right let's uh let's do a little draft talk before we get going um who, who are i know you paid quite a bit of attention to a lot of the potential eagles guys so who are some possible eagles targets that you think help themselves at the combine in that Maybe make more sense now after you saw what they did. I mean, I, I, I've really, I mean, Justin Jefferson from LSU has really, really grown on me. And I think part of the issue is there's this, I don't, I mean, I said it misconception in my mock draft that I did earlier today. I think there's this feeling in this sense that they need an outside speed, you know, speed threat at wide receiver. They have that in Deshaun Jackson. Um, do they need an insurance policy for him and another guy? Sure. But they don't absolutely need an outside deep threat to open up this offense. The problem last year is they couldn't get separation. Um, and separation comes from route running. It comes from quickness. It comes from speed, what have you. Justin Jefferson's a guy who not only can get separation, he's dependable. He's got great hands. Um he compared himself to Keenan Allen. This he's his profile fits a much more athletic Keenan Keenan Allen, um, and I just think he would open things up. Like if Nelson Aguilar was good at his job as a slot receiver, this team would have been a lot more successful on offense. Uh, I think Justin Jefferson's a guy who can catch ninety balls a year and produce in the red zone. He's very good in the red zone. Carson loves working in the middle of the field. I think. Drafting him at 21 makes a lot of sense to me. He's the wide receiver four in this class. I think Henry Ruggs is going to go top 12. I think CeeDee Lamb is going to go top eight. I think Jerry Judy is going to go top 15. Um, So, you know, trading up in that range, you're going to have to give up a second round pick most likely uh, because teams are going to be competitive trying to scratch and claw to get those top wide receivers. So there's going to be a market. You're not just negotiating with yourself, you know, and so I think Justin Jefferson makes a lot of sense. I think he can be Carson Wentz's best friend. It'll also free you up if he's working the slot to move Zach Ertz around out wide. Um, you can run 12 personnel with him and be, you know, he can play like as much as he played in the slot, his sophomore year, he played outside a ton. A ton. Uh, he can play the X spot in 12 12 personnel looks in 11 personnel. You move them inside. You've got Deshaun on the outside and you get some other dude on the outside as well. I, you know, whoever that may be. Um, I think if they handle the speed threat thing, even with a minor signing in the, in the off season or in free agency, I think Justin Jefferson makes a lot of sense. I do think since they have 10 picks, they will double dip at that position. That's the one earmarked for a double dipping. Uh, you know, we talk about corners. I really like AJ Terrell from Clemson. Um, this class does have a massive drop off after Ukuda from from uh, Ohio State, CJ Henderson, and Christian Fulton. Like after those three, there's a drop off in talent. That said, though, you know Christian Fulton's the, the man corner. He's really you know good at playing man. Uh, you've got Henderson, who's really good at playing zone. The Eagles play both, um, and you need a guy who can do both. I think Terrell is versatile enough. He's not at the talent level of those two guys, but he's versatile enough to play cover three. He can play man. He can play press man. He can play off man. Um, I do want to worry about C.J. Henderson. There are some concerns about his tackling. There's a play specifically against the University of Miami this past year where he basically dove 
like he was a sack of potatoes trying to avoid contact. Um, Fulton, I mean, I didn't love his film. I, I didn't hate his film. I think he's very talented, but he also didn't come up with a lot of inter- big plays and interceptions. So that's concerning. Um, I, I just think like they're at a point where day two is probably the sweet spot for corner. And I think AJ Terrell from Clemson in the second round or uh, 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 Troy Pride from Notre Dame in the third round makes sense. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of like guys that make sense in those first couple of days. Cause if we get into the weeds, it's going to be weird. But look, they, I think they're going to address defensive tackle either in free agency or in the draft. And I think Jordan Elliott from Missouri is maybe my favorite player that I've watched this year. Uh, I mean, I've only watched like 40 guys, but, um, you know, he, he to me is a guy who could easily take over from Malik Jackson next year. Uh, I like him quite a bit. He'll probably be around in the second round. Um, what I do think is important to note is I do think there's going to be a lot more offensive line movement in the top 15 than we thought there yeah. was going to be. Those dudes and, are freaks. Yeah, I mean, this is a freakishly athletic class, and it wouldn't shock me if, you know, maybe five of the first 12 picks are offensive linemen. Um, when you consider that there's probably three of the three of the top you know, 12 are probably going to be quarterbacks. That's eight positions right there. They're going to move some wide receivers down. They're going to move some safeties down. It's going to move some corners down. Um, And so I think that's beneficial to the Eagles. If I'm the Eagles, the highest I'm trading up is probably 16 because that's probably only a fourth and a fifth round pick. Um, I don't mind trading a third round pick, especially a comp pick that they're going to get for Nick Foles. But you want to keep that second round pick in this draft. Uh, That's where the meat of this class is going to be. That's where you're going to have a lot of options and flexibility. Um, Those third round picks do whatever you want with them, but there's that first and second round pick are are crucial in this class and they have to nail those. Yeah, I agree. Um, Were there any safeties that caught your eye? I really like Xavier McKinney uh, from Alabama. He, uh, had some issues injury wise with doing his, his 40 time, but he's a guy that I really, really like. Kavon Wallace is a guy from Clemson who I also like. He's not really rangy. He'd be probably more of a strong safety at the NFL level. Tanner Muse, his teammate from Clemson. I know I'm going very Clemson heavy, but you know, they're pretty talented. Hey, Brian Uh, Dawkins was pretty good from there. So yeah, yeah, he was all right. Um, (laughs) So Tanner Muse, he was safety at Clemson and teams asked him to um, move to linebacker or do some linebacker drills on the last day of the combine. I think he fits the Nathan Gary mold. I do think the Eagles would be very interested in him. A nugget that, uh, subscribers on Eagles extra learned about earlier this week or sorry, last week is that the Eagles are not going to spend like, I know there's this, there's this thought process of, Oh, Corey Littleton would be great. Blake Martinez. The Eagles are not going to spend a heavy amount of money, even with Nigel Bradham off the roster. Camus Grugier Hill is almost definitely not going to be here. Uh, I can tell you that. And so I think, uh, you know, they're going to look into some guys, uh, some names that I would watch would be AJ Klein from the saints and Nick Kaidakowski from the bears. I don't know if they're even willing to meet their price range. So I, I think, you know, the linebacker position is going to be something that's worth watching. And you want to look for guys who kind of either have safety backgrounds or on, or on the lighter side for the linebacker, a guy like Oregon's Troy die, or, um, you know, Tanner Muse, like I said, like, I, I think, the third round's probably the sweet spot for that, but yeah, I mean, linebacker is a perplexing issue to me. I, I I'm a hundred percent on board with not overvaluing the position, but you still value it. You know what I mean? And it, it just kind of seems like it's just, it, it's like you're making a peanut butter sandwich as opposed to a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with this defense. If that makes <laughs> sense, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Jelly's kind of essential if you you want the full experience. I know Scarlett Johansson eats a peanut butter sandwich in the Avengers, and it like literally makes me cringe every time I watch <laughs> Endgame because it's like, yeah, I'm just eating a peanut butter sandwich. 
Man, at least, some, at least put some bananas in there. Yeah, bananas, marshmallows. Do something with your life. Live a little. You know, <laughs> she's little. she's your black giving, widow. Come on. She's giving Captain America all this grief for not living. She's eating a peanut butter sandwich on True. on what looks like white bread. Like, there's no I mean, nutritional maybe, value. Maybe like maybe all the all the markets have like run out of stuff since half the world was eliminated. You know. But there's peanut farmers. Like what? Like what, what's going <laughs> on here? Like what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? We need to get Kevin Feige on the podcast to figure this out. The harbors are actually clearer, though, and you can see dolphins, apparently. So I, I guess that works. There you go. There you go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I came away from the Combine. I feel like I learned a little bit. They are going to be in the safety market. That's going to be a thing, but they're not going to pay heavily. I'm under the impression that they are open to having Roddy McLeod back. Um but I think if Roddy McLeod's back, Malcolm Jenkins isn't. And something I want to talk – we talked about Byron Jones. Uh, if you pay Byron Jones $17 million, that's nearly twice as much as you know Malcolm Jenkins is going to make this year. Uh, wow. Where's the conversation there? Oh, and by the way, if you're paying uh, Byron Jones $17 million per year on a four-year deal, he's not playing safety during that deal. That's not going to be a thing. That would yeah, go yeah. against – 20 years of philosophy. Um, I get he's versatile. And we talked about unicorns before. Like, just because the unicorn ha- has pretty colors doesn't mean you have to put it in, in a bunch of different, you know, sceneries or, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know where my analogy is going. But, like, uh. it's like everybody sees a guy who's versatile and immediately assumes he has to be versatile to be effective. That's not necessarily the case. You are signing this guy because you think he can be the number one corner. If you want to move him around, great. Could he be a safety in situational looks? Terrific. But, like, you're signing him to solve probably your most important problem on defense. Why, in turn, in two years, after you potentially lose Malcolm Jenkins or whoever, want to move him over to make yourself worse at a more important position and then move a guy who, look, he played safety at a okay level. I mean, he was good, but like he's playing corner at an elite level. That's why you're signing him to the money you were signing him. Yeah, I think that makes sense. All right. You, you have any last notes from the combine before we go? Um, yeah. Uh, so how we kind of avoided talking about resigning players. And I was just curious to you. Is there a guy that you think they absolutely have to resign? That, that's the funny part about their their free agency class. I, I don't think there is, honestly. Well, that's um, the thing. Like, that's why I'm kind of just like, I, I don't, I, I, I like to me. I, I was watching PFT's interview with Howie Roseman, and uh, Chris Sims was like. Man, I'm looking at your your free agent list, and it's so like long. Like you've got a lot to do. Like, aren't you like concerned about how many free agents you have? And how he didn't even like really blink, <laughs> which I think is actually the smart response to that. It's like none of these guys are like world beaters. I, I definitely think Jalen like a lot of role players. Right, I think Jalen Mills is coming back, especially if they sign Byron Jones. I think they sign Jalen Mills to a one-year contract and kind of yeah. hope that he proves himself as a number two. Because realistically, Jalen Mills can be a decent number two corner. He's just constantly put in a position where he has to be the number one guy. And if you're going to have uh, Byron Jones move around, that helps Jalen Mills because then he doesn't have to worry about going up against Julio Jones every every you know the Julio Joneses, the AJ Greens, the you know the DeAndre Hopkins of the league. Um, so I think that's beneficial. I mean, I, 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 like I said, I think they're open to bring McLeod back. I think Camus and, and Nigel Bradham are definitely gone. Um, I'm interested in what happens with Jordan Howard. He's one yeah, Steve, he, he's intriguing. I'll bring him back if it weren't made sense financially. Yeah, I mean, and I think it will. I think his market's going to be yeah, pretty weak. Pretty weak. Unless he like really wants to be a starter and is willing to t- bet on himself and take a one-year deal to just start. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think like dolphins or something. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, we can wrap it up on that. Uh, everybody make sure you sign up for Eagles extra. Mike has been killing it with those text messages. Um, follow us on Twitter, read all of our content, NJ.com. Leave us some reviews, right? Leave us some comments and thank you for listening. Bye.